What's up, everybody? Welcome back to my channel. Today, I have a very special requested guest. It is the one and only Max Middleman, voice of Ryuji from Persona 5, Philbo from Bug Snacks, and like a million other iconic characters. Welcome, Max. Hi. <laughs> Max is <laughs> Thank here. You. We were just saying he looks like a boy wonder. He looks very good today. Yes, in my yellow. Um, <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for having me on your show, your your interview show. Yeah, my channel. This is like kind of, it's like my pandemic project because I missed like interacting with people. Yeah. I'm like, well, what's a, what's a good excuse to talk to everybody for a while? Why don't I make a little YouTube show? And here That's we are. perfect. What a great idea. Uh, speaking of pandemic projects, that is something that I wish I had. Any kind of pandemic project. Because right now... My pandemic project, I guess, is me. I'm working on a lot of me. That's good. <laughs> it's given me that time. Um, nice. But I don't have any, like, um, I, like I'm not going to come out of the pandemic and be like, I made this masterpiece. I got nothing. Well, you know what? That's okay. Because I'm sure you're working on a lot of projects. I am. That's Voice good. I've been wise. working. I've been yeah. working. VoiceOver hasn't slowed down, thankfully, which is I know. great. Thank God, we're like the only actors that have been able to continuously work through this. Yeah. Which is crazy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think I was grateful. off for like two weeks in March when it was just like, oh, we're pushing everything. We're just gonna wait. And then- I was, was very like, excited actually when we were off for those two weeks because I never have time off. Mm -hmm. So I was like, this is kind of cool. And then, everybody wanted to catch up on what we missed. So then it became even worse than it was <laughs> before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What did you but do not, during- But not complaining, very grateful for it all. No, I know, I'm grateful too. But I'm, I'm curious, what did you do with your two weeks off? Um, I did a lot of like electric skateboarding. Like oh, I, have wow. an I have an electric skateboard and the only thing you could do was like go outside. So I went outside and I rode around uh, different neighborhoods and. <laughs> if That's awesome, still, actually. If anybody yeah, out there right. saw a guy in a bright yellow shirt riding an electric skateboard, it was probably me. That's amazing. I have a couple longboards that I like, but I haven't ventured into like the electric skateboarding world. Well, it is. It's an electric longboard. It's called the Boosted Board, Ooh. and it is uh, discontinued. They no longer make it. Uh, apparently, it was like, do you know who Casey Neistat is? He's this I YouTuber think. who he made this board famous uh or famous he made it popular um because he did this uh youtube video where he dressed it up like it was a magic carpet and like rode around the streets of new york on a magic carpet and we're like what that looks that looks amazing but it was just as he was just riding on this electric skateboard um so i got one and it's so much fun and like within the, a year of getting it i got a concussion <laughs> oh that sucks i'm sorry yeah and and I was wearing a helmet. I got the concussion even though I was wearing a helmet. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I'm glad that you're better now. We can't have <clears> you Thank concussed. You. Thank you. Yeah. So that's what I did during those two weeks. And, um, you know, during the rest of the pandemic, I've just, I've been making music and I've been working on VO stuff. And, um, yeah. Nice. That's, that's yeah. what we can do. Yeah. Cool. So I asked my followers if they had any questions for you, and we got a bunch of responses. Cool. Um, a couple people wanted to know. Here, this is from Big Ace eighty nine. What was your inspiration or passion to join the career of voice acting? So basically, like, what's your origin story? Yeah, my origin story is I was a very performative young boy. Mm -hmm. And I would always look for opportunities to um, to show off and and just entertain people. And um, like throughout, you know, middle school, I remember like I was always into like dance stuff and and gymnastic stuff. And in middle school, I would get on. This was the the the, the very first inkling that maybe I I was right for voiceover was. Um, I would get on like Xbox Live and uh, play video games and talk to random strangers and try to convince them I was from a different part of the world. 
So I would be talking like this tonight. It would be a terrible accent, like the worst, because I didn't practice anything. I would be, I'm from old England. And people would be like, no, you're not. And then the more I would do it, because I had so much conviction, they'd be Mm -hmm. like, are you really though? Like what part? And I'd be like, London. (laughs) (laughs) So that was, uh, that was how it started. And then when I got to college, I pursued a career in medicine. Or I was oh, wow. pursuing a degree in, in medicine. Um, I went from neuroscience to biology to kinesiology, then back to biology. Um, and then year four, I decided it, none of that was what I wanted to do. Mm. And I switched to theater. Wow. And um, got my degree. And around the same time while I was still in college, I... Uh, I, I took some voiceover classes outside of college and in college, and I was taking a ton of acting classes all throughout college. Like theater was my minor. Like I knew the whole time. So I basically, I switched it. I actually, that is what I did. I switched it. I switched from um, being a bio major and a theater minor to a theater major and a bio minor and just dropped the minor entirely by the time I, because wow. I was like, I don't even, I, my grades are so poor. I hate this so much. Aww. I I was like, nah, I'm not going to do it. So um so then, you know, I was auditioning throughout college and I was ready to hit the ground running when I when I graduated. Wow, that's great. Yeah. I feel like it's so rare to meet people who have like you seem like right and left brained. You know, you have like both sides. It it is interesting. Yes, cuz I I I I feel like I was built to be or maybe I was manufactured to be like, you know, I, I, organically, I feel like I, I don't know which one dominates. That, that is an interesting point that you bring up about me that, that I'm, I'm thinking about now because I've never thought about it, but, but that I feel like I need stability, right? Mm-hmm. That's something like core to my being that I need. I need like um, routine and stability, mm-hmm. but at the same time, I need that outlet. Because originally I thought, oh, I'll be, a, I'll be like a Ken Jong. I'll be like a doctor who acts occasionally. Cool. But, but then acting was so, um, so much more interesting to me mm-hmm. that I was like, I don't want to do the other thing. Forget it. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. It's funny because I would say <laughs> acting is probably one of the least stable careers that you could enter. Right. <laughs> Yes, I I literally did the opposite thing that I was supposed to do. Yeah. But now I would say, I mean, I was just like glancing at your IMDb before we hopped on so I could like familiarize myself with everything you've done. You work a ton. So I feel like you have that, like you've been able to make like stability out of acting. Like, well, is that right? That's, yeah. And it's interesting because I feel like I, in a way manufactured that like I forced yeah. that like I I had to make that happen for myself or yeah. else this career would not have happened yeah. like I, I knew just giving up the the biology major that every ounce of energy that I put into that I would have to put into the other thing and it's funny because when I got to the theater school eventually after four years everybody was like I remember being in in like shop class because that was something I had to take. And people were like, every student was complaining about the exam and how difficult it was and how many tools you had to memorize. And I was like, I just did, I just came off of biochemistry where I had to memorize all these complex molecules and how they interacted with other molecules. And, and people were complaining about the, the most basic stuff. And it's just interesting. Like I was so, I was so work oriented that it was, mm-hmm became so super easy for me to do that and I think I took that with me into the acting world but but I have been extremely fortunate extremely fortunate and very 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 grateful for for the career that I have so yeah yeah well you're definitely super talented and I love that you you've like made it your own because like I I love my artsy friends but they can be kind of like floaty you know what I mean they're kind of like in like a dream world and like this and that like not a lot of actors mm. or artsy people have that like drive and that like almost like militant like organizational side so yeah. i feel like yeah like you've been able to make it work so i if think you that's amazing 
if you saw me in the beginning um, of, of me trying to figure out the voiceover thing, it, was, it consumed every, every part of my day voiceover, I was trying to hack it in every way. I took like, I took maybe around 70 different workshops wow. um, over the course of like three years with wow. different casting directors. And, and on top of that, doing acting classes. And I did all the improv classes at UCB and I Me did groundlings yeah. and I did Second City. I did all of it. It was, yeah. Did yeah. you do, did you do UCB? I did. I did UCB in New York. And then when I moved here to LA, I loved it. It was so fun. But I was always like, like getting on a house team was like the epitome in my mind and my friends of like making it at UCB, yes, but yes. we like never made it. <laughs> and I was kind of like, I was like really frustrated with that because it seemed like all the same people are always on the house team. Like, how do you break in? Blah, blah, blah. Where like these other improv schools, it was like easier to be on the house team. Right. Yeah. Right. And then, well, what ended up happening was they, they made um they had ucb sunset yeah which just closed oh i didn't know that yeah that because sucks. of the i know because of the pandemic they closed their second location which i think is where they had all these other teams they were they had like the yeah. b teams or, or whatever they were calling it yeah and uh and now they don't have those anymore because everybody wanted to be on a team and perform mm -hmm. that was that was so the prospect of that was like it was like SNL and then just under SNL was getting on a team at UCB. It really was, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I always called UCB like the Harvard of improv schools. You know? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, I learned so much and like I had I had such a great time there. It was, it was so great. It was there. great. If I, I kind of there's a large part of me that wants to take more improv classes and Mm -hmm. and just just for fun like i'm i'm confident in in my ability now but yeah it's just a, such a good time it's like i want to go back i want to do it again yeah it's like playing like that's all it is yeah and there's no memorizing no anything like i would yeah. do the stupidest stuff in improv and it was just okay like that was my favorite part about it like you could just do anything and people yeah. would like support you and be like yes that's amazing like you know because it's that's, all about yes and so. and some of my favorite like people have that as part of, even if they haven't done any improv training, that's just who they are. They kind of yes and you, mm -hmm. um, because I still, I'm st still a goofball and I, you know, around my friends, I'll, I'll say, I'll do, I'll say stupid stuff and like, yeah. they'll uh, support me and I'll yes. be like, thank you. <laughs> thank you. you. You made me not look awkward there. I appreciate that. Yes. Oh. Such good times. Um, I probably left before you came in, but because I left before a sunset was a thing. Or not well, left, you did... I just like graduated and I was like, you know, getting busy with voiceover stuff. And then I, I didn't like, know I'm that doing more classes. I didn't know that you were from New York originally. Oh yeah. I grew up in Connecticut and then um I went to NYU and then I lived there in New York. Did you go to Tish? I didn't go to Tish. Cause I, so I studied journalism. Mm. All right. Like rewind it back. I started acting in New York when I was like 14. Uh -huh. um, and that's like when was I your got parent, Your parents drive you around to different auditions. Yeah. We'd yeah. either drive in or we would take the train, which is like such, it's a thing there. Sure. Like you just take the Metro North train in, you know, public transit. It's like way better than in California. Yep. Um, but yeah, that's how I started acting. And I never thought I could make a living as an actor because I saw like how unstable it was for like the adults that I would work with and stuff like that. Like they all had other jobs, like there were real yeah. estate agents or whatever. Um, and I was like, oh, I can't make a living being an actor, even though I love it. Like I'm going to study journalism. And then I graduated and I would like still like go on auditions and stuff. And I just missed it. And then I like had a job in New York and I would like sneak out and go on auditions and then I hated that job. So then I just ended up quitting. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to try the acting thing and like make it work. And here we are. <laughs> here we are. You did yeah. it. You made it work. Yeah. So that's like, I relate to you in the way where like you need some stability. Like mm -hmm. I needed to have that too. So there were times when I would have like a job and be an actor or have like two side jobs and be an actor. Cause I never wanted to yeah. be like starving artist, you know? Yeah. 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 Yeah, my my I, I remember my dad like 
in my early 20s, he was like, <laughs> it was post college and enough time that I was living at home where he's, he came into my room one day and he goes, Max, it's time. <laughs> you need to get a job. Oh, no. And I was like, okay. And my dad's never done that, but he's, I don't, it was so weird. And, and just as he was leaving my room, he goes, oh, and by the way, don't tell your mother I came in here. And then he left. And I guess because like my mom is the type of person who is, would be like, don't pressure him. And my oh dad my secretly was like, he needs to start, you know, pulling his own weight around here. <laughs> that is so funny. So wait, are you from California then? I am. Mm-hmm. You're from here. Okay. So that's I'm from the you're... valley. Oh, I Actually, didn't even know. That. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was, uh, I grew up around the corner from where I live right now. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, wow, oh, that's crazy. That's funny. I think, I feel like it's funny because you didn't act when you were like little and it would have been so easy for you to like get involved in the industry here. But also like, I'm glad that you didn't because a lot of people like lose their whole childhoods to like auditions. Yeah. And, and actually my mom saw that because my mom was, was an actor when she was younger and my brother was like a child model. Oh, no Um, way. Yeah. He like modeled for toys and stuff. So, um, so my, I guess my mom. And I would tell my mom when I was younger too, mom, I want to be an actor. Mom, I want to be an actor. Mom, mm-hmm. I would go on, I would go on. I did. I went on a couple open calls. Like I, 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 uh, <laughs> I auditioned for um, Kids Say the Darndest Things. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I, I blew it. I blew it. I couldn't, I couldn't. You couldn't say the, the darndest thing. Once the camera turned on, I clammed up. And I was like, Aww. And they, they would ask me questions and I would just give them yes or no answers. Oh. Yeah. You know what? It's okay. <laughs> Cause you are <laughs> where you are now. And I feel Because like, of that. Exactly. Like you wouldn't have gotten here if you had been on that show, maybe. Yeah. I like that. I like that you think that way. I do. You had a great path. Everything happens out. for a reason. It really does. You just have to be like patient. Yeah. At least that's what I tell myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's talk. Oh, I like this question. This is from Scarlet Electro. What role changed your life or affected you in some way personally? <sighs> what role? If there affected was one. In some way. Um, Kose, um, Ko, I was going to say Kose in your line April is a, uh, pretty touching role. Um, that was also a really nice role for me, not, not just because of the content of the show, but the recording. I got close with Patrick Seitz, who directed me. And, uh, you know, I remember we all traveled to Boston to do like the English dub premiere there. And it was, you know, we met the Japanese creator wow. and we all went to dinner. And, or he was the, he was like the, the director of it or the creator, the artist, um, real bad. But anyway, he, uh, he was such a nice guy and, uh, it was just, it, they're just fond memories from, from various shows and doing things. That one was really, was really cool. Um, I've got, I've got a couple, like m- most of my fond memories are like early on in my career. Mm-hmm. Um, like my first animated booking my first original character my first you know um so but but as far as like roles that really moved me actually Merowim in hunter hunter is uh is one do you do you watch hunter hunter hi kitty cat i haven't watched hunter hunter this is jocko he he joins for every interview He'll hi be jocko shortly <laughs> in hunter hunter uh there's the character Merowim that I play, who gets, he, it's, it's a great arc to where uh, from, he starts, this, this little girl comes into his life, um, this blind girl, and he's like this evil so-and-so who kills people. Oh my gosh. And uh, throughout knowing this girl and like playing these games of, it's like kind of like playing chess with her, this mm-hmm. game called Goongi, um, he becomes like, 
she touches his heart. And at the end of it, he, he totally transforms into someone who, um, in a strange way, after being so evil, has a little bit of compassion and a little bit of um, whatever else. And so anyway, I, I teared up when I was, because uh, didn't, I didn't know how it ended when I recorded the last episode. Spoiler alert, he dies. And, uh, but he dies in the most touching way possible. And I, te- I teared up when I, when I watched that and when I was performing it. So that was really, that was a cool one. Nice. That's yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, I'm not in Hunter Hunter. But I know like a lot of the anime shows, I feel like we do get more of an opportunity to like bond with the cast members because of conventions and things like that. So yeah. Yeah, like I worked on this show called k about a girl band. And like that's how I became such good friends with like Stephanie Shea and Christina V and Christine Cabanos. Like, and we're mm. still, because we would like travel around to the cons together to promote it. And like we're still good friends. Right. To this day. Aww. Yeah, it's nice. Okay. Um, Paroli1908 wants, wants to know which, which characters you have played. Wait, which of the characters you have played is the one that you identify with the most. All right, so do you identify with any of your characters? I, I identify with every one of my characters to some extent. Mm-hmm. Even the evil ones. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> that was deep, yo. Um, because, because, as you know, if you're playing an evil character, you cannot yourself think that you are evil. Mm-hmm. Um, most times you think that what you're doing is the right thing. And so which one do I resonate with the most? Is that the question? Yeah. Um, I guess, I guess I always say Ryuji because I, I can think of multiple times in high school when there were various authority figures who were trying to get me down and I wouldn't let them get me down. And I felt like what they were doing was unjustifiable. And yeah. Ryuji often feels that way. Um, just by nature of being a phantom thief and just who he is. Mm-hmm. It's like if there's an injustice, then he, he wants to make it right in some way, uh, even if it's beyond his control. And that, that's, I resonate with that. Nice. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up Persona because a ton of people have asked about it. And with Strikers coming out, I feel like we should definitely talk a lot about it. Let's. Um, somebody wanted to know now, of course. Oh, here we go. Anna the Merchant. What was it like voicing Ryuji when you got cast? So basically, like, I don't know. Tell me how you got cast. Sure. What was it like? What were your first I- sessions like? I remember, don't, I don't know how it came up initially, but I knew that I was up for that role. I didn't audition for it. Mm-hmm. Did you audition? Kind of. And the, the, what you're saying is what a lot of people have said. Like, I got called in because I voiced uh, this, like, cat-like creature in an anime called Madoka Magica. Okay. Yeah. And they were like, "We like, we liked you in this, but we don't want you to sound exactly like this. So we're gonna bring you." Who is they? Was it Atlas or PCB? Atlas. Yes. So that's the same thing. I did an Atlas game, where they were like, "He could probably do this character." Ah, Okay. It's interesting that they found you from something that wasn't even an Atlas property. Yeah, it was Anaplex. Yeah. Yeah. So they they watch. They know. They know what we're doing. They do, which is which is which is why you always have to give a hundred percent in everything that you do. Very true. Everything you do has to represent, you know, the best of your ability. But I, I remember being up for the part, um, or submitted for a role in Persona Five, mm-hmm. and I wasn't familiar with Persona. I I looked it up, and I feel like I'm getting brighter. By the way, like I leaned back away from the light. And all of a sudden, like, I'm like You're a becoming of the sun. Um, so I remember being 
up for it and I researched what Persona was and then I was obsessed with it and I researched Persona 5. And I only, for whatever reason, I only wanted to be Ryuji. And I, I didn't want to be any other character in the game. And it was really, it was really between two characters, I thought, for me. It was like, the, it was either going to be the, um, the protagonist or Ryuji. And I was like, please let it be Ryuji. Please let it be Ryuji. Please let it. I remember telling my friends, Ray and Robbie, we were at lunch and I was like, I think I'm up for this role. And, and I just want this one character, this one character. And then I got it. They were like, you're obviously Ryuji. There's literally nobody else that we want to play Ryuji. Uh, and I was like, you made the right choice. Yes. Um, because I, I love, I genuinely love that character. I, mm -hmm. I, I love all the characters I do, but I have a really, a, a, you know, a s certain affection for Ryuji. And I just, I feel like I get him. I, I get him. I like his, I like that he can be comedic. He can be really serious, you know, and really passionate about what he's doing, but he's got these comedic moments and I love playing them. And the directors kind of just let me do whatever I want to do, mm -hmm. which is also really cool because it is a Japanese property, but it doesn't feel like I'm copying anything. Right. Yeah. So I think that's what's so special about it is a lot of the Japanese properties we work on, whether it's an anime or a JRPG, we are either matching timing and lip flap or, or you know, someone's listening in going, hey, let me listen to the reference. Uh, a little, a little like, more like this. Yeah. And they really didn't do that with me. And I don't know if that's because I just sort of, the character clicked and I, and I was doing it kind of, you know, perfectly with the Japanese or just because they liked my take on it. Mm -hmm. I liked my take on it. It felt super original. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so that's how it happened. That's how I got cast. I, I didn't, do anything but I, it was from um, Megumi Tensei 4. Sh yeah um, a lot of people yeah. have said that that they were heard in that game and so they like Xanthi was saying that that's why she got brought in yeah because she was in the Shin Megami Tensei 4. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so I played Hallelujah in that Hallelujah and they they liked it so that's how it happened and I'm really that's a, it's it's one of like I said it's one of my favorite things I've ever done yeah so that's yeah. awesome so you said that you did a lot of research on persona because you didn't know what it was is I that mean, how you like approach most of your auditions when i'm when i have good work ethic yes <laughs> sometimes <laughs> well i mean uh, i get it if it's yeah. a property that exists you could for you know what I feel like now I feel like I feel like I did more research back when um, when I was kind of first discovering the world of the wonderful world of voice acting because I was it was all more fresh to me and I and to, in order to understand something I had to do the research for it mm -hmm. but now I, I'm more familiar with different archetypes and the tones of different projects yeah. that I don't necessarily have to do as much research as, as I did back then. But if there is something where I'm, I'm unsure about, I will always put in the work. I will always do my research, especially if I book the role. If mm -hmm. I book the role, you better believe I'm going to put the work in to understand what I'm doing before I get to the session. Yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, nowadays, for instance, when One Punch Man came around, the I looked at it and I thought, oh, this is just like this is just like every other anime audition. I'm just gonna go in and do my my anime thing, mm -hmm. and, you know, because you kind of get you you look at a picture and you go, oh, I get it, I get that character, yeah. but I did not get that character, and I it took watching the show uh, at the request of my friend Ray Chase, mm -hmm. he was like, no, you, you don't understand. This is a different type of anime. You need to watch the, at least the first episode. Mm -hmm. So I watched the first episode and then I binged the entire season. 
and completely changed and informed the way I did the character. So it was just a good lesson for me mm-hmm. where I thought I knew something and yeah. it was actually something completely different. Yeah, you raise a good point. There was an anime that I did called Twin Star Exorcists. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember why, because I don't usually like watch the Japanese before I audition. Because mm-hmm. sometimes the turnaround times are so fast. Sometimes I don't have time. And sometimes, like, you would just look at a picture. I'm like, oh, yes, a magical girl. Like, this is it. But for this one, something about it, I was like, no, I need to watch the first episode. And I was like, oh, this is re- actually really dark. And yeah. this character is, like, I call her my Wednesday Adams character because she's so monotone. And I don't know if I would have done the audition like that if I hadn't read, if I hadn't watched it. And then I ended yeah. up watching it. So... Oh, cool. The lesson for, for, for everybody watching for, who wants to be an actor pays to do your research. Do your research. Put in the work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay, so a bunch of people have asked this. But I'm going to shout out Ricky Raymond because he's on my screen right now. Was Shout out, Ricky. A t- Hi, Ricky. Hi. Um, was there ever a time when recording Persona 5 that you actually said the F word? And a bunch of people wanted to know, like, what's the deal? What's the deal with Ryuji and the F word? Enlighten right. us. Right. Right. So, as you know, <laughs> Ryuji, <laughs> Ryuji does not say the F word. And uh, that is because he's such a good boy. Um, <laughs> And during the recording of the initial game, I believe I, there is a line where he does say the F word, but it gets cut off. I'm pretty sure they cut that off in post. I'm pretty sure I did say the the full word there. By the way, you know what I just watched? There's a great uh, show on uh, Netflix called... uh, um, the history of swear words, I think it's called, Ooh, and it's it's hosted by Nick Cage, and uh, the first episode is about the F word, and it's mwah, it's great. Anyway, so th- did I say it? Um, I mean, I think so. <laughs> but did it make it in the final game? Did not make it in the final game. No. He has not said it so far in any of the. Um, persona projects but who knows yeah uh, it could happen still it could happen maybe. yet maybe here's hoping <laughs> um what was your experience like recording the anime and i'm just gonna tell the people watching the persona 5 anime was recorded very differently than any other anime that we've ever recorded Usually we de- we preview the line and then we say it and it's a, kind of a laborious process. But for the anime, they just kind of let us roll and they fit in all the lines after. Yeah. So what did you think of that? I'm curious. Yeah. It was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> what an interesting uh, way of going about doing something creative. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, it's dubbing is dubbing is just inherently weird when you you know i just it's a weird thing to do so that was an attempt to make it more streamlined i suppose and i don't i don't necessarily know from my from my standpoint as an actor i i like to be able to wrap my head around everything so I like to see the picture and I like to preview mm-hmm. stuff. And I'm not saying I like to go slow through it. Like I definitely don't like the slog of like having to wait between lines and be like, yeah. when's my next line? But, but I do like to get a full picture of what's going on in a scene. And I, there was a, I'll say this, the director was amazing uh, mm-hmm. at, at filling me in. Um, I don't know. Six of one, half a dozen of the other. You know, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> what did you way. think about it? What? What did you think about it? So in the beginning, I wasn't like allowed to see the picture because we were going so fast and it like threw me off. 
because I wanted to know, like you, what was going on in the scene. I wanted to see it because in anime, we can always see the scene. Um, so I was doing my best. I was a little worried it wasn't going to come out. But then after a couple sessions, they started letting me see the picture and I felt better about it. But watching it, it looks good. And I think yeah. we all sound good. So it's just another way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. All right. Let's talk a little bit about my favorite project from last year. And I love Persona, but I freaking loved working on Bug Snacks. Bug Snacks. So good. Ooh. <laughs> oh that was a that was such a fun project. I know. So we and, were both in Bug Snacks. Go and ahead. the only project, the only game that I've ever worked on with an ensemble recording yeah. at one at the same time. Yeah. I've only done that with one other game, and it was a long-ass time ago for a game that came out on Steam called There Came an Echo. Um, but Bug Snacks, I mean, that was like seven years ago or something. Bug, and Bug Snacks was the first time that I'd been in a room with, what, what do we have, 10 people in there? No. 10, 12? I feel like we had more, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was like 12. Yeah, there were a lot of us. And, like, heavy hitters, too. Yeah. I was like, holy shit, it's everyone. <laughs> yeah. It was super cool. It was super mm -hmm. cool. And it was su it's such a cute game. And uh, uh, I keep being, getting pestered to, to play through it. I haven't played through it. Yeah. Because um, I don't play a lot of video games. But, um, but I should play through it because people are telling me how, how fun it is. And... Uh, yeah, it was just a, it was a great little property. Yeah. I loved how involved the developers were. Like, they flew out from Chicago. They were watching us in the session. And I just loved meeting them all. Clearly, they, those were a group of people who were passionate about the voiceover element of the game. Mm -hmm. And they cared about who was coming in to record. Yeah, and they did a really great job, I think, of um, of casting, uh, of just casting a really like a variety of really fun, quirky people to play really fun, quirky characters. Yeah, How it was many, great. Yeah, did you audition for it more than once, or did you just audition once? No, I auditioned for it more than once. Okay, yeah. that's what I've been hearing. And I was like, yeah, I yeah. auditioned for it one time. And I'm like, what, what's the Oh, deal? really? I oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, it was at least two times for me. And I, okay. I think it was maybe three. Um, I can't remember if I'm wrong. Sorry to... Well, it, at this point, it, it was a long time ago now. So it's... Yeah. Okay. But, uh, but definitely, I remember like looking at it and be like, again? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But it's always it's always I mean when if it's not a requested audition then it's like I guess I'll just you know either you you go and you do the same exact thing cuz I've done this. I've auditioned for something twice where I wasn't like a request for the second time. Mm -hmm. But like the specs have changed or whatever and I'll do the same exact thing and I'll book it. Yeah. And like, you're just like, I don't know. Maybe like they, they didn't, didn't even listen. To my first one. Right. Yeah. Right. And then, but for this one, that wasn't the case. This one, they requested to hear me a second time and they, they gave me subtle, some subtle adjustments. And um, yeah. And then, and then I booked it. Nice. Um, but super fun. Philbo Fiddle Pie <laughs> will go down as one of the greatest characters of all time. Seriously. Yeah, I love the dope. names. And I think they told it. So I'm Bethika Winklesnoot. Bethika Winklesnoot. Mm -hmm. I feel like they told us that they used like a random name generator to make up right. the names. Yeah. Yes. I thought yeah. that was so funny. It was like a random name generator, but it was like, yeah, they just like pieced them together. Mm -hmm. Amazing. It's so like of the moment. I heard that that's how Post Malone got his name. <laughs> yeah, he like did a thing like, "What's my rap name?" and it came. 
<laughs> Post Malone. Post Malone. I want to look that up. I want to find out my rap name. We should uh, do I it. also I also play Crapple in Bug Snacks. I don't know if you know where I go. Crapple, Crapple. He's a crab apple. Oh, cool. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, Crapple, Crapple. Yeah, we got fun. to play a couple Bug Snacks. I rem- I th- I did three, but I can only remember one that I did, and it was Lolive. Like a like an olive with like the tongue hanging out. Uh, I'm like, la, la, la. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I want to meet, uh, do you know who Caro Caro Bonito is? They did the song, right? Yeah. 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 I want to meet them or her one day. Be like, I'm Thuba. <laughs> <laughs> go to Go to the concert. Yeah, maybe at a, like a con when cons are a thing again, we can meet. That would be cool. Amazing. Um, yeah, I haven't played Bug Snacks either, sadly. I have watched people play it. That's kind of like how I get my gaming fix. I'm not a good yeah. gamer. Like, I've never been really good. I'm, I, I like competitive games, so I play a lot of competitive games. But, um, but games with stories... I, I don't know. And Buck Stacks is so short. It's like 10 hours. Yeah, like I should be able to, to Persona. Huh? Compared to Persona, which is like 180 hours or something. I tried to play Persona. I couldn't do it. It's long. I love that game and I love the characters and being a part of it, but I, playing through something that many hours, yeah, I can't. It's a lot. I get it. But since Bug Snacks is only 10 hours, maybe that will be my weekend. Who knows? <laughs> you could do it. You could do it. Do you believe and there's me? No, and there's no, like, crazy skill that you need to play. You That's know, good, like, because I have none for video games. <laughs> you, you could just mash the buttons and probably be fine. And do something. That's, yeah. that's pretty much me. Like, I have, like, Mario Kart. I can play that. Kind Classic of. game, though. Anybody can get into Mario Kart. That's like and, and they don't make games like that anymore. Let me just say, as let, let old man Max come in for a second and oh. say that they don't make games the way they used to. They used to make games for everyone. Now it's not for everyone. <laughs> but if it's here's an, an actual thing. Like I, um, friend of mine when he was, um, when he was, I knew this. <laughs> I've known this. Uh, kid since he was a baby and when he was like 10 we went to GameStop and I was like I'm gonna get him whatever the equivalent of like Crash Bandicoot is or Mario or and all I could find were shooter games uh. shoot 'em ups and war games and just like adult games and nothing that was like inherently Fun. I think I think um, it's kind of come full circle because now they have the Nintendo Switch, yeah. and there's plenty of fun games for that. Yeah. But that was there was a, honestly I feel like there was a weird in between uh, time where they just weren't making those kinds of games that like everybody could just yeah. sit down and mm-hmm. have fun playing. And Bug Snacks is one of those games, which is why that's cool. Yeah, that's why I love it because it's a game for everyone, and there's no yeah. violence. Sure. I feel like shit's too violent, like in the real world right now. Like I don't want to play violence because it's too real right now. Yeah, I right. want to play bug snacks. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Get me out of whatever's happening in front of me. Yeah, Put me in a, in a pretend reality. Yeah, exactly. It's healthy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, so we are about out of time, but I would. I feel like I would be letting everybody down if I didn't ask you to say for real. So will you say it for us? Oh, I suppose. <clears throat> for real? Yes. So good. <laughs> so good, Max. Thank you so much for coming on my channel. It was great to like really get to know you one-on-one because I feel like this we've is- always been in like group situations, so... It's been yeah. an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. This is really fun. Yeah, no worries. And I'm just now realizing, are you sitting on your bed? I am. I don't leave my bed anymore. <laughs> <laughs> this, is your interview. this is your office now. 
Yeah, pretty much it's my bedroom, you know. That's amazing. Pandemic times. Maybe one day in the next 365, hopefully, I will be in a studio. Maybe we can, like, make this official someday. I'll have, like, a whole professional setup. That would be fun. Fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah here's hoping. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, Max, thank you again. Thank you. And we'll see you next time. <laughs> Peace. Bye.